Wir werden uns zählen bis zum letzten Haupt von Mann und Ross. Und wir werden diesen Kampf bestehen, auch gegen eine Welt von Feinden. Noch nie war Deutschland überwunden. Hey, hey, people, Raz here. For decades, Germany has proven that being bad can look so goddamn good. The bad guys get the coolest uniforms, the best weapons, and the most iconic names. Whether movie studios are busy basing all their enemies off of them, or whether they're straight up using Germans as villains, it's hard to argue that Germany hasn't had a significant cultural impact on the world in the last 80 years. I mean, it's pretty easy to see why Germany gets picked on nowadays. Anyways, today we'll be discussing a tank. A German tank. That's right, gang. It's time for the A7V, or in German, the Strumpanzerwagen. So buckle up and put on your spiky helmets, because it's time to piss off some French people. The A7V is kind of a historical anomaly. This was a tank that was built to only traverse flat ground in a front that didn't have any. It only went 3 miles an hour, was so top heavy it would flip over, and was so armored that it had to have two engines and yet it still couldn't keep it from getting stuck in the mud. All in all, this thing was considered a complete disaster by the German high command. It was made by Joseph Vollmer, who also famously designed the A7VU, which was basically just a cheap ripoff of the Mark V. The K-Wagon, Germany's thickest boy, and whatever the fuck this thing was supposed to be. Anyways, the Germans initially ordered 100 of these to be built, but after the first 20 were put into action, they pretty much changed their mind on the spot. They took one look at it and said, eh, let's just give that medal to the Kriegsmarine. I think this will be better used on submarines. This tank was considered so bad that even German tankers didn't want to use it. They preferred the captured British tanks because they worked better in the trenches. So, what made this thing so bad at the end of the day? Well, let's start out with the vehicle layout. First off, the engines were dead center in the middle of this vehicle, cutting off the front from the rear, except for very narrow openings that only one person at a time could slip through. Also, it suffered from the same issues that the British tanks did, and did not have adequate ventilation. Because of this, they had to add massive cooling grills on the top of the vehicle to help vent out the ungodly amount of smoke caused by the two engines, six machine guns, and cannon. The next issue was the amount of people they tried to cram in this thing. The crew consisted of two mechanics, one driver, one commander, 12 people to operate the machine guns, and three on the cannon, making the minimum crew usually about 19 people. It carried 10 to 15,000 rounds of machine gun ammo and 180 shells for the cannon. Some missions added a detachment of three to four infantrymen, signalers, and a freaking pigeon guy. After seeing their next great idea, the K-Wagon, I'm assuming the German army was just trying to put the whole goddamn army in a tank. <laughs> Literally, they tried to fit 25 guys in this thing. It's like the clown car from hell. On top of it being cramped, smoky, and hot, the other issue was that the cannon was fitted with an annoyingly finicky sight that meant you had to literally stop the vehicle to fire it. Initially, they went with an over-the-barrel point-and-shoot kind of sight like the British had, but being German, they decided to over-engineer the hell out of it and gave the thing enough zoom to literally fire four kilometers away. It was a good idea on paper, but when you're trying to shoot and move, the sight was so zoomed in you literally can't see a thing because it's bouncing all over the place, so you had to stop and shoot, making you a gigantic target on the battlefield. Realistically, the sight was never going to be used because most of the trenches on the western front were closer than four kilometers apart, and you'd be pretty damn ballsy to think you could aim that far over the smoldering hellscape that was France at this time. 
Also, the guns were so high up that it would leave massive six foot blind spots all around the tank. So if the enemy got too close, you were better off just hopping out and pistol whipping the enemy to death. The last glaring issue is that there was next to no armor on the top or bottom of this tank, meaning that it was just one good grenade throw away from killing the entire crew. I've given this tank a lot of crap, but it wasn't all bad. The Germans built really cool features in that would allow the commander to direct fire using lights to tell the crew where to look for the enemy and when to stop and start firing. Also, when used on flat ground, this tank performed pretty damn well, especially in the Battle of villers bretonneux I can't really blame the designer of this tank for all of its flaws, because the German high command didn't show him what a tank looked like before he made this, and gave him some really weird requirements which kind of doomed this thing from the start. Each tank was handmade because they weren't able to ever get an assembly line up and running, meaning that each tank had different features and improvements as they went along. Note that you'll probably see that again during World War II. It's a real shame it was such a cluster, because this tank is really badass looking. I feel like if it had been deployed in Russia or the desert, it might have done pretty well. Unfortunately, the German High Command just decided to push this thing out of the nest and see if it would fly. The service history of this thing reads like a comedy. Ten of them were damaged in combat and then abandoned by their crews, five of which were captured and used in parades by the Allies, museums, or on firing ranges. Most of them were scrapped by the 1940s. One participated in the world's first tank battle and got destroyed. Three broke down and were blown up by their crews. One flipped sideways and was abandoned by its crew. Two were cannibalized and just scrapped for parts by the Germans and one was used by the German Frying Corps, and then it got scrapped later. One got lost in the fog and was so turned around that it started firing at its own soldiers, and since these tanks were so secretive, they fired back and destroyed it because they didn't know it was theirs. The last one got captured by the Aussies, and now is the only surviving example housed at the Queensland Museum in Australia. While normally this tank would have just been a historical footnote, its badass appearance has kept its memory alive. I mean, look at this thing. Imagine it this coming at you. The British troops who saw this in action nicknamed it the Moving Fortress. And this tank really feels like a Moving Fortress. In Battlefield 1, it's easily my favorite tank to drive. Anyways, on to the review, but first, let's see what gifts God King Kobe has provided for us today. Ah, it's a fine German beer. Now, if you thought we were going to get through World War I without talking about beer, then you, my friend, are not German. Germans are basically alcohol-fueled elves that want nothing more than to drink some beer and build some wicked cool machines to go mess with the French. As it turns out, I'm part German. That might explain my irrational love of war and why autistically zoning out and building stuff is my favorite hobby. Whether it's video game level design, Legos, computer networks, or YouTube, I definitely caught the beer-fueled mad scientist gene from my German ancestors. Beer was basically a constant during the war. In fact, when supplies were allowed, they were issued a half liter of light beer, one fourth liter of wine, and usually a shot of schnapps, which again was basically Everclear. Hilariously, one German officer said that this war could not be fought without beer. He said regularly when you were rotated back on duty in the trenches, most men got drunk on their first night back to cope. While official policy was to execute men who were drunk on duty, German field commanders knew they were fighting a war of attrition and weren't about to kill their own men if they didn't have to. The large amount of alcohol really only happened in 1914 to 1915. After about 1916, German alcohol supplies ran drastically short, so typically they stole whatever they could from the enemy or the countryside. The Bavarian units were the most inventive though, because they just brewed their own beer on the front lines. Yep, Germans everyone. Anyways, on to the review. The A7V is probably my favorite tank of the war. In my opinion, Kobe basically knocked this one out of the park. This model has so many intricate details that make it look absolutely amazing. The doors on the side, the cupola on the top, the German trooper with the pickle hubba. It has amazing detailing on the guns, the cannon, and the hull. Unfortunately, that's where my praise for this model ends. It has some drastic flaws. The first glaring flaw is the back prints don't match. I've checked online and this seems to be a common theme on other people's models too, not just mine. 
Next, the track tension and rollers are god awful. And while this thing rolls fine, it drags a lot because the area where the roller is trying to grip on is just a bunch of plastic pegs. My next biggest complaint is that this was built to 148 scale. And because of this, it is way too big against the minifigs. Honestly, this is a model only for collectors and not kids because it is also extremely delicate. It's incredibly easy to break this if you grab on it too hard and it is really hard to reassemble once it's broken. This is not a model that you play with. This is legitimately just supposed to be left alone and displayed on a shelf. At the end of the day though, all opinions are relative, so I'm giving this a 10 out of 10. Just like the real tank, it has a ton of glaring issues, but who cares? Thing looks badass. Thank you for watching. As usual, you're all truly wonderful. This is my last video of the World War One series for now. I may make more in the future if Kobe releases more vehicles, but at this time I don't see any more that I want to buy. So keep your eyes peeled for the World War II trailer dropping soon. Lastly, I do want to leave you with something spicy. While I was building this set, a spider fell from my ceiling onto my table, and I got my reaction on film. Needless to say, it was pretty damn funny. Enjoy. Because if the girl said no, then the answer obviously is no. No. But the thing is, is she's not gonna say no. She would never say no. <laughs> <that. laughs>